Broadcasting from Singapore and broadcasting all around the world. You're listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast, taking the pulse of educators from all over the globe and bringing what you need every week. Now, over to your host, Craig Kemp. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the EdTech Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Craig Kemp, and I'm thrilled to have your support. This podcast episode is sponsored by Education Perfect, known by many as EP. EP is a global leader in online differentiated blended learning, a tool that revolutionizes learning outcomes and teacher productivity all around the world. Education Perfect provides content in multiple curriculum areas and languages in countries all over the globe to support learning in an engaging way. Their platform is incredibly powerful for teachers and leaders through the detailed data analytics that it pulls to inform learning. They even integrate AI to automatically suggest next learning tasks for students based on their results. To learn more about EP and to get a free trial, visit bit.ly slash EP videos now. The links are in the description below. As I've shared before, I continue to work with the incredibly talented Mark Quinn to improve the final audio quality of this podcast. He has his own podcast production studio that provides editing and mastering services to content creators. To connect with Mark, please see the details in the podcast notes below. Last week, I talked about creating the new normal. I hope you had the chance to go back and look into this within your school. This week, I want you to think about differentiation in educational technology, something that I'm super passionate about. As a public and private school teacher for more than 15 years in both New Zealand and Singapore, I know the importance of differentiation when it comes to student learning. One of the things I didn't harness early in my career was using edtech tools to help differentiate learning. Now, with the power of technology, we are able to differentiate learning easily with a little bit of planning to ensure our students can learn whether it's face-to-face or remote. My question to you this week is how do you use EdTech to differentiate learning in your classroom or school and what are your favorite tools for doing so? Please share. I look forward to hearing from you soon. A tool that has positively impacted the authentic and purposeful use of technology into classrooms and meeting rooms that I have worked in is Epic. Epic is an engaging online reading tool used by millions of students all over the world. My schools have always used Epic to support and differentiate the learning of literacy in our classrooms. This week, my six-year-old daughter went back for her first week of school and came home on day three and said, Dad, we have to download Epic on our iPad at home. It's the coolest app ever. She was pumped. And for me, when an app for reading gets a reaction like that, I am in. Epic allows teachers to differentiate reading to all students in their classroom, engage interest and understanding at the same time. It's a great tool to add value to your literacy program. I highly recommend that you take a look at Epic by visiting getepic.com. The link is in the description below. This week, I wanted to discuss mobile phones and their value as a learning tool something that's pretty controversial in many schools. In most schools I've worked in though, mobile device policies have been strict and limiting. Although in my work as a consultant supporting schools all over the world, I've seen a diverse range of approaches to mobile devices. Whether you believe that mobile devices have a positive or negative impact on student learning, you will be the first to understand the value mobile devices hold within our society especially among young learners. Kids as young as six or seven are now getting smartphones so their parents can stay in communication with them. A lot of this stems from fear, which is understandable. But do our kids really need phones that young? As a parent of a six-year-old myself, I can tell you that it will be many, many years before I succumb to the pressure and give my daughter a phone. She simply does not need it right now. And of course, that's my opinion. With that to the side, let's focus on mobile phones in schools. To generalize mobile phone policies in K-12 schools, in my experience, the average is below grade four, no mobile phones at school. Grade four to eight, mobile phones allowed at school, but they must be kept in the office or locked away in a locker or at the teacher's desk until after school. And grades nine to 12, mobile phones are allowed, but restrictions are in place. They can't be used in certain areas of the school, for example, hallways, bathrooms, locker rooms, but they can be used in class to support learning at the teacher's discretion. I'm a firm believer that mobile phones can have a positive impact on learning if they're used in the right context for the right learning experience. As an ex-design teacher myself, 
a mobile phone was a necessity for documenting learning and developing an evidence-based portfolio, and as a teacher, I encourage the use of them for this purpose. Yes, kids will take advantage of it, but if you're firm with your rules and you play it hard at the start of the year, they will play the game, trust me. I've been there. Mobile devices are powerful learning tools that can be used to harness learning experiences that we couldn't do otherwise. Let's meet our kids halfway. We know they're engaged in devices, so instead of ripping them away, blocking them and saying no, let's allow them with some restrictions and let's help them co-create these rules for use. Please share your mobile device policies via social media by tagging me at MrKempNZ. If you're after support or ideas for a mobile device policy in your school, Please don't hesitate to reach out and I'd be happy to help. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Every week, I bring you a short interview with some of my edu heroes, an engaging learning experience with someone who makes a difference in education every day, with a particular focus or angle towards educational technology. This week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Sylvia Rosenthal-Palasano and Seti de Klerk. Let's have a listen to both of these chats. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Sylvia Rosenthal Tolosano. You might know her as at Languages on Twitter with 28,000 followers, where she constantly shares positive vibes and amazing resources. Sylvia is a third culture kid who now calls the US home. She is a keynote speaker, workshop host, and author, and is passionate about world language teaching and digital storytelling, amongst many other things. Sylvia, it is an incredible pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk education and technology integration? I am. Thank you for having me. An absolute pleasure. Why don't you start by describing your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? So currently, I'm a professional development consultant. Uh, I coach uh, educators mostly at international schools. And my roots are I'm a blogger and um, recently um, published a book. So I'm a a traditional author, I guess, now too. Wow, that's really cool. And what inspired you to get into all of this? I guess my inspiration is uh, first my children and my children are now um, grown up and I am a grandmother, a grandmother of three. So when my oldest granddaughter was born, it was pretty much, she was most likely, she will see, she will, um, she will live into the 22nd century. So she's class of 2028. I have another one, class of 2035, and my youngest granddaughter was just born last week. Um, She is going to be class of 2038. That is what inspires me because they will live to see the 22nd century. That is so, so cool. Congratulations. That's such an exciting time in life, isn't it? Yes, definitely. So talking about that, the future of education and that excitement that that you live every day by, what excites you about education today? So for me, my big, um, when I get goosebumps, when I I feel it, I hear it, I see it, um, or other educators sharing new forms of teaching and learning. So um, several years ago, uh, when Ruben Puente Dura, he came out with his SAMA model and he started talking about substitution and augmentation, modification and uh, re- uh, redefinition. It's that redefining stage that, that always excited me the most. Doing something that it would be impossible to do before. And I really never, um, it never meant for me to just record a video and upload it to YouTube. And that is redefining because we could, we could get a global audience. That's not really what I meant. It's, it's finding really new forms, something that we had never imagined before, something that, um, that are new ways for, for us to, to learn that is not just substituting something different or something we had always done before with a technology tool. Yeah, I love that. And uh, sort of my role as an ed tech consultant working with schools all over the world, I think there's such a, a, a lack of understanding of that SAMA model and and how to sort of use that m- uh, model to invigorate your learning, to try and something new, to investigate new ways of thinking and learning and uh, integrating technology to um, add value to, to your learning process. So it's really good to hear that. What's your best advice for educators in relation to educational technology? I would say is experience it for yourself. You need to put on the hat as a learner 
um, leave your head as a teacher out for a little bit, for a while, and, and really see yourself as a learner. How would you use that tool to, to learn in new forms, to learn differently, or to just be reflective of, is my learning changing at all? Or could I have done that with a pencil and a paper? So the advice would be use the tool for your own learning. See how you can collaborate, communicate, co uh, connect and create in different ways. For you and I, Sylvia, we met uh, on Twitter and we connected and we engaged. And I think what drew me to you as a learner and a sharer and an educator was your positivity, your willingness to share, um, your constant positive vibes on your Twitter feed. And I think for so many people, that's what puts them off is the, the negative side of Twitter, the perceived negative side of Twitter. But in my experience, Twitter has only been positive because I pick and choose who I want to be in my network. I am connected for a professional reason and I'm connected to educators from all over the globe. Tell us about your choice of professional learning networks. Where do you engage and who should we be connecting with? So um, primarily, I started out as a blogger and um, I started my languages blog in 2006 and um, in 2007, when Twitter came along, it was really an afterthought. It was like, well, I'll try it to see if I can drive traffic to my blog. And, um, and I think I have, over the past 14 years, I have witnessed a little um, a shift that the conversation has shifted away from blogs. I don't see as much back and forth uh, comments going on on the blog and that has shifted more to a tw the Twitter platform. So I still use both. For me, for me, my blog is my way of reflecting, my way of documenting my own learning, of connecting my thinking, my thoughts, my uh, action research, and to to have obviously um, a, a longer um, a, lo a, a platform where I can I can really I can write. And so I, I have not, I've, I have not abandoned my blog, but Twitter for me has become more my curation platform, which is the, the selection and the choosing of resources, adding value to it as well, and funneling these resources to those people that follow me. So it's not just for my own, uh, for my own learning, but also for the learning of others. And for me, you know, just as you said, as we met on Twitter, I, I also am fiercely very uh, protective of my network. I use it only for professional purposes. I want to make sure that the people that I follow will contribute something, that um, there are educators, that they are, that they are choosing to engage with me, that they will, they will ask me questions, they will give me feedback, they will f curate their own resources, and they're, cr they're adding value with any information that that they have or um, or thoughts or new forms <laughs> that they they can contribute they can, they can add perspective to my learning everybody has a different um, they have different needs what my network might not be the right network for you I have for me as a trilingual person I want to have on my Twitter feed, I want to have German in there. I want to have Spanish in there. I want to be able to read at least French since I can understand it. But that might not make sense to you. For me, it resembles how my brain works, how, you know, the thoughts that are in my head that are in different languages and from different cultures and perspectives. So that might not work for you. My suggestion would be find hashtags of interest. Find that one person that you are really um, you're really connecting to on a professional level that they are contributing to your learning and see who they follow and double check that, that these people would also add value to your learning. So I, I usually use the word harvest, <laughs> harvest a hashtag, a Twitter chat or harvest a hashtag conversation, see who's contributing. Those are things that I would be looking at. And those are the people that I would, uh, I would suggest for you to make a decision on if you want to follow them or not. That's great advice. I, I love that advice and I couldn't agree more. Uh, you and I both connected to a lot of people online and we have conversations with people all the time. I get asked this all the time. So I wanted to ask you, what is an ed tech tool that you're currently 
loving the use of? What do you use every day that you think everyone listening should be jumping onto? It's your cell phone camera. It's, it's, it's the one that you carry with you all the time. Um, as I said, uh, one of my, my passions is um, documenting learning. And um, I have found that my cell phone camera is the greatest tool because I have it always close by. When I, see, when I think of the process of learning, how do I capture, how do I look for learning and then how do I capture that learning? I use my, my cell phone camera most. So um, don't underestimate what you already have. As a, second, as a second option, I guess, or what I use every day is WordPress, which is a blo- the blogging platform because it allows for that, uh, it allows a, a space where you can share your reflections, you can share your learning, you can share, uh, you can capture your curation and share it. You know, obviously that's, I'm very big, uh, big on that. So uh, WordPress is a worldware platform. It is not, it wasn't inherently designed for, for schools or for educators, but um, it is, it is a great, it's a great tool to be able to start all those now skills that we talk about, the communicating, collaborating, connecting, creating, and, um, and being able to, um, to really create a hub for yourself of your learning that you can, can share with others. And um, one, I guess one, it is worldwhere. Um, but it, maybe it's a hybrid, worldware and schoolware, which is Flipgrid. It is, I think it's just a great, a great tool for families. It is a great tool for, um, for schools, for learners. Um, even if you're not connected with a teacher or you're not connected with, uh, with classmates, you can, you can still capture and reflect and, um, and share and archive and organize your own learning and um, and thinking. Thank you. I'm pleased you mentioned Flipgrid. I think Flipgrid is one of those tools that on the SAMA model really is a good example of the R, the redefinition of learning, because as a tool, it gives us so many ways and opportunities to redefine learning, to make learning something that we couldn't have done without the use of technology. Um, I couldn't agree more with, with Flipgrid. I love it. So learning is important to all of us, and, and you've talked about that already today. Um, and I can see from everything you share that learning is critically important to you. I mean, your trilingualism you talked about, uh, I, I barely speak English really well. So for me, when you're talking about all these languages, I'm in awe of you and what you're able to do. Um, I love to read. I love to engage in learning. What's one book or resource that you would recommend to the listeners that you've been reading lately, or just one of your all-time favorites that we should be exploring? So there's no way I can pinpoint one. <laughs> um, I I would say my all-time favorite one I come back to and I recommend over and over again is the book Curriculum 21 by Heidi Hayes Jacobs, which she has um, uh, edited uh, and published in 2010. And it was the very first book that actually put it in writing um, who um, authors who were able to articulate all those things I was thinking, feeling, uh, but I wasn't able to articulate at that point. So Curriculum 21, um, in the very first chapter, Heidi Hayes Jacobs says, what do we need to keep? What do we need to throw out? And what do we need to upgrade? And how timely is that at, in this moment in time when we're thinking of what are we going to do when we get back to school? Those are exactly the questions uh, we need to ask ourselves so Curriculum 21 by Heidi Hayes Jacobs. The second book, which is a constant recommendation for me, is uh, a book by Alan November, Who Owns the Learning, where he talks about we need to help students become self-directed and self-motivated learner learners. And again, no time better than now when these skills are more and more important knowing how to motivate yourself and how to, um, how to be a self-directed learner um, as we are moving, you know, as we are in the middle of the distance learning, remote learning or emergency learning, any of those, those terms that you, you might be using um, in 
in this first semester of, of 2020. Another last book to, not last book yet, but one book, I, um, I, a little more, I think that was published in 2018, Social Media by Jennifer Casa Todd. I was really drawn to the way she, she asks educators to move away from teaching that digital citizenship as a way of be careful, don't do this, privacy, and don't get abducted, and all those things that could happen when learners share and, um, and are online and are active online and visible online. She wants to, the mind shift is from that, um, all those negative things associated with digital citizenship to move to digital leadership. How do we teach not, and I'm saying learners, that includes adults, <laughs> learners in that new, in those new platforms, how do we teach them to become social leaders and uh, using media, um, social media platforms uh, for leadership? Um, so that's definitely uh, a book I would recommend. And last but not least is um, Visible Learning. Uh, by a team of researchers from Project Zero, if you're familiar with uh, visible thinking routines. In that book, Visible Learning, um, it is K through 12, um, the focus, looking at, um, at pedagogical documentation and based on the Reggio Emilia uh, method. Definitely, that's my, that was, I know you asked for one, I gave you four, but I couldn't choose. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, you've talked a bit about other people's resources and books, but you're actually an author yourself. Tell us about your book and what inspired you to write it and why should we pick it up and read it? Yes. So um, in 2018, I, pub I co-published a book with Janet Hale, who was actually the one um, <laughs> that convinced me to write it. The book is called A Guide to Documenting Learning, uh, Making Learning um, and Thinking Visible, Meaningful and Shareable. And um, I had been, that topic, how do we document learning, has, um, I've blogged about it for years. And she constantly um, tried to convince me, I need to write this book uh, in a traditional paper book to publish, uh, to have it published, and um, to be able to get it into the hands of the people who don't necessarily read blogs. She felt it was important to write these topics down and to, to explore this in, a traditional, uh, in the traditional paper book form. Why should you pick it up? I guess it's, um, the idea is documenting learning. The book is, is about bringing awareness to that process of documenting learning. It's a process which is not just look at what we did, but how do we document learning in order to help us understand the learning process better and to share it so our own understanding or our own experience will help the learning of others. Making that part of, um, of your learning network and, um, and, and sharing it. And pretty much, I mean, as you said, that's always has been my mantra on Twitter, on my blog, I share. And I, I don't do it for others, but it just happens to be when I reflect on my learning and I make that available to others, they learn from me as well. And that is what helps my motivation. It helps direct how I keep going. And I think that is, that is something that we can, we can figure out how to use that framework with our learners all the way from preschool to professional, uh, professional development for adults. The book shares a framework and it, it shares also a learning flow routine that breaks down these steps for the reader. And um, we have tools, platforms, examples from all different levels to help you support, I guess, that documenting process. I think one of the things that a lot of teachers, they said, oh, no, please don't give me one more thing to do. Or schools are, schools are saying, no, this is not for us. We have right now, we have a different focus. We have a different initiative. We are, um, we are focused on this school year or next school year. And I guess I want to just make sure that um, documenting learning will help all your initiatives. It will help you reach all your learning goals because it is a framework that can be applied to anything. If, if your school is looking for project-based or is into project-based learning 
or you're working on um, on design thinking, or your or your school's initiative is um, is student portfolios. Whatever it is, that documenting learning framework is going to deepen the work and is going to capture the learning all the way from the learners in the classroom to the teachers who are teaching it, um, as well as for schools when they're looking to document institutional memory, especially at international schools where there's a high turnover of, of educators and students. Many times an initiative has started and then the, the teacher leaves or the, the department head leaves or the, the head of school leaves, somebody else comes in, something else is completely being done. And then when they leave, the next person comes back and starts the whole initiative all over again. If there would be institutional memory, if we had that documentation, we can start building onto what was done before. It is about adding that value instead of reinventing the wheel. Yeah, so that I guess would be would be why I, uh, why I think you should be reading it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sylvia. I think uh, as you're sharing that, I have thought of several schools that I work with that could do with reading this. So I'm going to be passing those details on and definitely having a read of it myself. So thank you for that overview. What's the best way for listeners who are here today and really want to follow up with you and connect with you? How can they do that? I would love for them to connect with me. And the best way to do this is probably via Twitter. And as you mentioned before, I'm, uh, I guess my online name is Leng Witches. And that is not just like Spanish, German, or English, but the, a witch. And Leng Witches more than one. Same thing, you can find and connect with me through my blog, langwitches.org, or um, through Instagram, um, also at Leng Witches. Wow. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know you're going to have lots of people coming and connecting with you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Today, I have the honor of speaking with Seti de Klerk. You might know him from Twitter and YouTube, where he's a constant creator and sharer of learning. Seti and I have been connected for many years now, and although he's based in Thailand, we've connected face-to-face -face at many events and conferences. Seti is a Google superstar and is my go-to guy with any questions related to Google. His YouTube channel, Flipped Classroom Tutorials, has over 120,000 subscribers, and his tutorial videos get hundreds of thousands of views with new videos every few days. Seti, it's a Pleasure to have you on the show today. Are you ready to talk about education and technology integration? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be on the podcast. So uh, yeah, let's get into it. Let's go. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your current role and what inspires you to do what you do? Um, well, at the moment, I'm sort of um, split in between two different roles. Um, so first of all, I am the teacher based in the makerspace, which is everything to do with sort of um, design thinking and digital innovation. And then on the other hand, I also try to support as much as possible with the integration of technology within other lessons. Um, so as a class teacher over all those years, I've always been a huge fan of integrating technology wherever it is useful. Um, and so that's sort of the message I try to get across to all the teachers at our school. And City, you have access to people all over the world you connect and engage in many ways what excites you about education today i think what especially sort of during this time what's amazed me is just how the the online community of teachers has gotten together and how everyone just keeps connecting and sharing ideas with each other and sharing resources and and that's what just motivates me to keep going because I'm seeing so many amazing things going on and, and people are willing to share it. And that's what makes me really happy. You do a lot of sharing. Uh, I saw one of your videos just tick over a million views the other day. Tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel, Flipped Classroom Tutorials. What inspired you to start it and how's it changed over time and why should we check it out? So, um, yeah, I, it all started with sort of a place to store my videos. So I was making a lot of videos for staff, for students, and I wanted somewhere where I could store it, not have to worry about storage limitations, not have to worry about bandwidth or how they would access it. And so YouTube was sort of the instant, um, the first one I thought of, and that's where I stored all my videos and they were all set to private until a friend of mine, Davis, and I, you know, Davis, um, suddenly said, well, why aren't you just 
turning these into public videos. Like I want to use some of these videos at my school. And I was like, okay, I'll just set it to public so that you can use some of these videos. And it just suddenly, it kind of blew up because the next morning I sort of opened my channel and I saw that one of the videos had a hundred video hits. I was like, wow, a hundred views. I don't think he has a hundred students in his class. And then sort of the next video was like 300 views. I was like, well, this is definitely not just our schools. Um, and I just, I just kept uploading new videos and it's just, it's really, it's grown from there, really. Um, seeing that teachers were leaving comments saying that this is helpful and I've really, I've, I've, I've enjoyed using this in the classroom. And that's what sort of keeps me motivated then to make more videos because I'll happily put in the time to make a video if it helps one teacher. And then obviously because it helps that teacher, it'll help the students as well. So that's what really excites me. Yeah. And your, and your journey, Seth, has been pretty amazing. It's been great to see the, the YouTube channel grow and really thrive and flourish, especially over the, this lockdown time where people have been wanting and thriving and sort of reaching out for this sort of learning. What's your best advice for the people listening today in relation to educational technology? Personally, I would say, and, and I know that you always advocate this as well, is always start from the why and always look at what are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to do with your students and why are you gravitating towards a certain technology? And is that really the best use of your time or is that the best choice? Because sometimes pen and paper is the best choice and that's the best technology that you can use. However, what I try to do on the channel is I try to approach different technologies from different angles. And so I'll never just limit myself to only Apple, only Google, only Microsoft, only that. I'll, I'll try to actually use all these different applications, give you the pros, give you the cons. And then it's really up to you as a teacher to start from your why, which is going to be different from mine because your students are different from my students and then make an, a decision based on the facts and the information available. And th through this journey, I know you've connected and engaged with so many people. Tell us a little bit about your choice of professional learning networks. Where do you engage and who should we be connecting with? For me, really, I have two platforms that I'm absolutely in love with. And I mean, first of all, we've got YouTube and YouTube is really I just love sharing video content there and connecting with people in the comment section. So whenever I get questions in the comment section, I will, I will try my best to either find out the answer to that question or answer the question in the comment section. And I've actually learned a lot from reading those questions. So things that maybe I didn't think about or, um, struggles that teachers are having that I hadn't even considered and I'm reading them in the comment section. And so then that kickstarts sort of my own journey of, let me just look into that and let me find out how to do that. And then on the other hand, Twitter, I'm, I love Twitter. I'm just every single day I'm, I'm reading things on Twitter. I'm getting ideas. I'm sharing with people. I think Twitter is more instant, whereas YouTube is a bit more long-term. So you can find videos from a month ago, from two months ago, three months ago, whereas Twitter is really what's been going on in the last 12 hours, what's been going on in the last 24 hours, and let's just connect with people. You, in your shows, Siti, you do a lot of looking at tools and particularly Google tools, but ways of connecting and engaging. And like you said, the pros and cons, so people can go away and make their own choices uh, based on their why and their context. Tell us about an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your day-to-day -day work. Well, interestingly, it's actually a non-Google tool because um, even though I've got a lot of Google videos and a lot of Google tools, I absolutely love what Microsoft has been doing with the new Edge browser. And in particular, the immersive reader, the immersive reader in Edge is absolutely brilliant. It is just such an amazing tool that not only helps teachers, but students. And it's just, when I first saw it, I was blown away, blown away by what it can do. It is, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't heard about it, just look it up. The immersive reader in Edge browser it is brilliant. And I'll put the link in the description below so people can jump on, have a look at that. CT, as educators, learning is critical and so important to all of us. Can you recommend to us one book or resource that you've been reading lately or just one of your all-time favorites and tell us about why we should be exploring it? Interestingly, that it's again, it's, it's, a, it's not from an education point of view, but it does impact. 
um, education in general, and it's it's um, a book called Tribes. I'm not sure if you've heard about Tribes. It's from Seth Godin, and it's really based on marketing, and it's all about finding your tribe. But so many of the things discussed in that book, you can use as a teacher and sort of see your classroom as your tribe or see your professional learning community as your tribe. And it's all about finding your tribe and then empowering those members of your tribe to start sharing and to start inviting other members to your tribe. So I found that just um, an amazing book. Um, so you can find it. It's um, by Simon Sinek, and he's got many videos about it as well. So if you have a chance, look up Finding Your Tribe. Great. And I'll make sure the link to that is also in the description below. Sidi, you have so many people on your Flipped Classroom Tutorials channel on YouTube that uh, I'd describe them as pretty powerful tribe, really, that are connected and engaged. And you do a fantastic job of sharing. What's the best way for listeners to follow and connect with you? Um, well, first of all, definitely on YouTube. Um, YouTube is where I spend most of my time. So if you go to fliptutorials.com, you will automatically be forwarded to my YouTube channel. Um, you can connect with me there, or you can find me on Twitter as well, Seti de Klerk, my full name, and then you'll find me on Twitter as well. Those are the two main platforms where you can connect with me. Seti, thank you so, so much for your time today. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Next week, join me for episode 17 of the EdTech Chat podcast, when I'm joined by the incredible Victoria Thompson. One of the things I love doing is giving away prizes as a thank you for tuning in, listening, and hopefully subscribing to the EdTech Chat podcast. Last week, Education Perfect gave away a $250 subscription to their game-changing product. To win, you needed to complete the form at bit.ly slash edtechwin. The winner has already been contacted directly by me, and it is Cal Warwick. Congratulations, Cal. This week, Education Perfect is giving you the chance to win another $250 subscription to their game-changing product. To win this, you need to go to bit.ly slash edtechwin and complete this simple form. It'll take you less than a minute to do. The link is in the description below. Competition closes on Wednesday the 26th of August and the winner will be contacted directly by me and announced on next Friday's podcast episode. Good luck. If you enjoyed today's episode, please smash that subscribe button and share it with your colleagues, friends and families. I appreciate your support. Please remember to spend two minutes to rate the podcast too, so we can reach even more educators and edtech enthusiasts globally. Please share your favorite part of today's episode by tagging me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram or LinkedIn. And please don't hesitate to ask me questions that I can answer in an upcoming episode. Remember, you have the chance to win as well. Check out the links in the description for more. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to the EdTech Chat Podcast. Creating a community for educators to learn, share, and grow. If you like today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And be in the drawing to win prizes every week. If you know others that would enjoy the show, please hit that share button and brighten their day. Join us again next week for your weekly EdTech hit with at Mr. Kemp NZ. We'll see you again soon.